AI is a powerful tool. This summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values. Welcome to AI for Good the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. So welcome also from my side. Good afternoon. My name is Joachim Denzler. I welcome you uh, to today's webinar of the AI for Earth and Sustainability Science Series. I'm leading through two exciting presentations this afternoon. We will have today, especially I welcome the two speakers of today's session, Sarah Biri and Miguel Mahecha, both of whom are developing methods from the field of AI to come to a better understanding uh, of the processes that we are seeing due to climate change. Sarah will start with her talk. After that, she will take some questions before we move on to Miguel's presentation. Now I'd like to introduce the first speaker to you, Sarah Biri. Sarah is currently a visiting researcher at Google working on urban forest monitoring and will join MIT as an assistant professor in the Faculty of Artificial Intelligence and Decision Making in September this year. She received her PhD in computing and mathematical sciences at Caltech in 22, uh, under the supervision of Pietro Perona. Her research focuses on building computer vision methods that enable global scale environmental and biodiversity monitoring across data modalities, tackling real world challenges, including storm spatial temporal correlations, imperfect data quality, fine grained categories, and long tail distributions. A really important task in computer vision, the most dirty data that you can uh, acquire and work on. She partners with non-governmental organizations and government agencies to deploy her methods in the wild worldwide and works uh, toward increasing the diversity and accessibility of academic research in artificial intelligence through interdisciplinary capacity building and education. Most known is the open source mega detector developed by her and their team for detecting animals in camera trap images. Uh, most of the people working on wildlife monitoring uh, know this uh, toolbox and it's widely used in such applications. Sarah, I look forward to your presentation entitled Mapping the Urban Forest Across North America, a case study in computer vision for large scale environmental monitoring. Thank you very much for the introduction, Joachim. It's great to see you. Um, let me share my screen really quick. Um, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, like Joaquim said, I'm going to be mostly talking today about um, 
urban forest monitoring and how to sort of think about trying to scale up our ability to understand the urban forest using computer vision and a combination of different types of heterogeneously sampled data modalities. Um, but first I'm gonna start by just motivating why I think things like environmental and specifically biodiversity monitoring are so important and, and are such impactful applications for us to work on as computer vision researchers. Um, so first, just biodiversity is in catastrophic decline globally. Um, this is biodiversity across the taxonomic tree. Um, everything from, you know, large scale mammals down to birds, down to insects, down to microbes, other types of vertebrates. Um, this paper from 2015 actually also showed that not only are we seeing really severe reductions in species and in, in species extinctions, for example, we're we're currently seeing extinction rates um, that are about as high as the last extinction of the dinosaurs. So we're basically living through what's being termed the sixth mass extinction of biodiversity. Um, and those rates are climbing exponentially across the taxonomic tree for mammals, birds, and many types of vertebrates. And not only are we losing species at a rapid and, and increasing rate, we're also just losing the amount of animals, the population sizes of, of wildlife globally. Um, the World Wildlife Fund, they put out what's called the Living Planet Report every few years. And um, the most recent numbers estimate that we've lost about 69, close to 70% of all of the wildlife on Earth since 1970. So um, that's really striking. And, you know, these things are not just important because the natural world innately has value. This stuff, biodiversity um, and the natural world actually is also really intrinsically tied to many things that are very important to us as a human society. So if you're not motivated enough uh, just to try to work on these problems based on the value of the natural world um, as something of beauty, uh, it's also actually really important for us. Um, biodiversity has been intrinsically tied to climate change in both directions. Climate change is one of the big um, hypothetical factors or that, that are affecting these reductions in population size and in uh, extinction rates, or in reductions in population size and increases in extinction rates. Um, but also biodiversity contributes to climate change in interesting ways and actually helps in some ways to mitigate it. Um, forests are responsible for sequestering a huge amount of the carbon that we produce through industry. Um, but then there's been a lot of really interesting recent work investigating the role of bioturbation, of the aeration and processing and circulation that takes forest carbon, tree carbon, and translates it into soil carbon. Um, tree carbon has life cycles around 100 years. Soil carbon, it's more like a thousand. So it's a much more stable place to store carbon. Um, biodiversity has also been intrinsically tied to public health. Um, basically, when you're seeing reductions in population size, reductions in habitat, you end up with less genetic diversity in your wildlife population um, and a lot of stress. And those two things combined really lead to an increase in disease susceptibility. And then as we're seeing the habitat reduce and more interaction points between wildlife and human societies. Um, you know, for example, like the, the increase we've been seeing recently of, of coyotes in Los Angeles. Um, what we do, what that presents then is a risk for the translation and transmission of zoonotic disease like COVID. Um, biodiversity is tied to food security. Not only are clearly pollinators very important for growing the food that we all eat, um, recently, there's been research that demonstrates that diversity of pollinators actually leads to increased nutrition in our food. So our food is less nutritious as we're, you know, if we have reduced biodiversity of pollinators. And finally, the kind of obvious one is ecosystem services. It is that intrinsic, um, you know, carbon capture, soil stability, uh, stormwater runoff mitigation, all of this stuff that are provided by forests, animals globally. Um, and so, you know, this is something that I, I've been passionate about for over a decade, and I'm really excited to see how much growth we've seen in this area of AI, computer vision, tied to environmental and biodiversity applications. Um, 
But what we really like to do is be able to scale up, is be able to continue to build better and better in AI methods um, to enable us to really understand much more than we already do about the world. Because honestly, most species on Earth are what's considered data deficient. We actually don't have enough information. Um, and it's been amazing to see with hardware improvements in the last you know, five to 10 years, we've, we've seen this huge explosion in the types, the diversity and the amount of data um, that we have globally. And I know that Miguel is gonna be talking a lot about um, data from space. And that's, that's one component of what we have here, uh, satellite-based, space-based Earth observation. Um, we also have observations from low-flying low aircraft that are often much higher resolution, but much more temporally sparse. We'll have information from sensors directly placed on animals, biologgers, that are both giving us information about animal behavior, but also sometimes are these active sensors of things like ocean temperature or salinity. Um, we have these networks, vast networks of stationary sensors, stationary cameras, um, bioacoustic sensors, sonar. Uh, that are collecting information from these very, very limited spatial windows, but at really amazing temporal resolution and al allowing us to see underneath that tree canopy and things like the rainforest. Um, and then increasingly, we're seeing this explosion of what's called community science data or citizen science data. Um, one example of this is data coming from the amazing iNaturalist platform where any passionate community member can go out with their cell phone and, and take a photo uh, and that can actually, of, of any plant, any animal, any bug that they see, and that can be translated with community labeling into a research grade species occurrence record in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, but one of the challenges is that all of this data can be very, very noisy. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's lots of it that can be empty. There's huge amounts of occlusion. It's not sort of highly curated data. Um, and so that means what that means is that we need to actually figure out, need to make better models on the AI side to be able to handle getting the information, that very important scientific information out of these raw data streams that are, you know, geospatially biased, uh, noisy, and and often very long tailed. Um, most of the species on Earth are are a few, you know, very very common ones. Uh, most of the animals or the plants on Earth are from a few very common species. And there's this incredibly long tail of rare species that are sometimes the most scientifically important to, to capture. But um, machine learning is really bad when you have rare examples, things that you don't often see. Um, those are, that's one of the areas we really struggle with. Um, and then, you know, just emphasizing that biased dimension, um, really, Earth data is not independently and identically distributed. It just isn't. Um, you know, it's that's this underlying assumption in almost all of machine learning that the data we have is IID. Um, but really what we have, if you look um, over here on the right, this is all of the species occurrence data in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And you can see that it's incredibly spatially biased um, towards, you know, the US, Europe, maybe Australia. It's incredibly temporally biased towards maybe the last five years. Um, and then when you look at where we actually have biodiversity on Earth, we can see that it's mostly in the sub-equatorial tropics. So it's almost anti-correlated with where we have data. And then this, this biodiversity, the distribution of these species is also for any given species, both non-uniform, highly correlated to environmental characteristics and changing due to climate change. So even if you could have a perfect picture of the distribution of all species on earth today, next year, that's going to change. So we really cannot avoid this domain generalization challenge and particularly domain generalization under distribution shift if we want to build machine learning systems that can really scale effectively for earth and environmental and biodiversity monitoring. Um, and so we need better methods to measure and improve that domain generalization to do better uh, in new domains where we have limited data. Um, and finally, a lot of parts of the world that we might want to monitor can be very remote. Um, and these things don't live in a vacuum. Somehow the data needs to get to the model. Um, the information from that model needs to be surfaced to decision makers, multi-sector stakeholders. 
Um, and so what we really need actually are human AI systems um, that maximize the scale and the availability and the reliability of the monitoring that we do within the available resources of a given region, of a given uh, agency, of a given NGO. Um, and one of the dimensions there that actually I think is more and more important as we're moving into the world of large models um, is that most NGOs uh, really do not have the capacity to work with and the computational, the data storage capacity to work with things on the order of large models. Um, and so model efficiency for both uh, inference and adaptation on the fly um, ends up being more of an equity question than anything else. If we want these models to work everywhere on earth, we cannot require them to be massive. Um, so there's really this push towards things that can work with less and less resources closer and closer to the edge in very remote environments that might not have bandwidth to directly transmit data. Though so that's slightly increasing as we're seeing more and more satellite coverage. Um, and what we've really found in our work over the last decade is that um, one thing that's very important is, is rigorous experimental practices um, in computer vision. So that means understanding that this data is very imbalanced that it's the distributions are going to change. You need to really evaluate your models as they're going to be used. If you want to use a model um, for camera traps, for example, so this example here is the mega detector that Joaquin mentioned at the beginning. If you want to build a model that you expect people to be used on regions of the world that it wasn't trained on, maybe even just camera locations within a region it wasn't trained on, um, and in future seasons, it's important that you evaluate that model versus those things. You build these sort of reason reasonable splits. And what we found by doing that, by really trying to build rigor rigorous experimental practice that emulated the intended use of the model as closely as possible, we found that while species classification still really struggled to generalize, really struggled to handle that subpopulation shift, the differences in distribution, um, that human animal vehicle detection would generalize well. And so then we were able to build a model and deploy it um, that just does human animal vehicle detection. It doesn't solve anyone's problem end to end, but it does really increase human efficiency in these monitoring systems, um, which I think is a huge win. So for example, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game uses this model. Um, they have about 2000 cameras that are, they use to do their wolf population management. They collect 11 million images a year. Um, and now for the first time, um, because they're using our machine learning models, they're actually able to process that data in the year it's collected. So that means they're setting policy instead of on data that's five years out of date, on data that's actually you know, accurate now. Um, similarly, we found the direct collaboration and you know, engaging with domain expertise really leads to the development of methods that make significant gains on important problems. Um, a lot of the computer vision and AI literature tries to build things that are as domain agnostic as possible. You know, oh, my model works on uh, self-driving cars and you know, internet images and satellite data. But we found that the gains really improve quite a lot more when you actually try to build systems that capture domain structure explicitly. So this is an example where we were really explicitly building systems for static cameras um, that built up really long range temporal reasoning, implicitly using attention. Um, we found we could get, you know, sometimes close to 20% improvements, improvements in mean average precision, which is a notable gain for computer vision. And it's often not possible when you're building a system to try to work for every downstream application. Um, and finally, we really think it's very important to deploy your methods, go beyond just writing a machine learning paper and actually take those methods and directly engage with practitioners and deploy them in the field, move beyond these static benchmark data sets and bolded numbers in a table and actually build computer vision solutions that are living and engaging with the changing world, because that's really where we learn um, where modern methods fail, when we really go beyond um, this sort of clean, artificially balanced static benchmark data set, and we actually deploy these methods. So this is an example of an individual elephant identification system we've had deployed in Kenya for a few years, working with the Mara Elephant Project. Um, it's a participatory system, and it's enabled them it's enabled them to get demographic information for the, the transnational elephant population for the first time. And it's enabled us to understand how and when 
to actually request information from a human? How do you really build these participatory selective prediction models in challenging scenarios like elephant re-ID um, that give you reliability of your system while really making humans as efficient as possible? Um, so yeah, our big goal is really trying to figure out how to monitor the environment and detect change across scales globally and in real time, you know, small things. Um, and so most of the rest of the talk today, I'm going to be discussing a specific case study in trying to figure out how to map urban forests. Um, so urban forests have a myriad of benefits to the over 4 billion humans worldwide who live in cities. Um, they support regional biodiversity. They end up reducing air pollution significantly. Um, these forests sequester carbon. They help reduce energy use. Importantly, now, as we're seeing temperature spikes um, kind of globally, they're a huge factor in reducing the effect of urban extreme heat islands, urban heat islands, which are already starting to lead to human death. And they've been demonstrated to improve both the physical and mental health of those who have access to urban green space where they live. Um, but unfortunately, these benefits are really not accessible to everyone in a city. Um, this is just one example. A similar story shows up almost all the cities on Earth. But if you look at a wealthy area like Pasadena, here's Caltech where I did my PhD, you can see there's a huge amount of urban greenery that's available. And if you move to somewhere like Carson, you know, a different part of Los Angeles, much more racially diverse, much more socioeconomically disadvantaged. There are very, very, very few trees in the area. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we can try to do just to understand this inequity is build scalable models of tree canopy. You know, where is canopy coverage of trees in cities? Um, and then this can be used by organizations like the amazing organization called Tree Equity Score to build explicit and actionable equity maps for urban planners. So they can actually take these, you know, tree canopy maps and Google's been working um, to build tree canopy maps. Now they've deployed them for over 500 cities globally. Um, and now they're, then they're partnering with Tree Equity Score to give them access to these improved, more accurate maps. And then what Tree Equity Score does is they build these equity, like equity scores per county or per region of a city. So that when then the city is choosing how to allocate its resources, it can actually seek to um, specifically target replanting in areas with reduced equity to access of green space. But it turns out that tree canopy prediction alone, though it is something that's scalable, sort of similar to how um, the mega detector is scalable because it's only doing animal detection, it's not doing categorization. Um, the tree canopy prediction also tends to scale well because it's not doing categorization. Um, categorization seems to be something that's very difficult to generalize and lots of hypotheses about where that, why that's true. Um, but it turns out we need more than just the canopy. We need actual individual locations and species identification to be able to do a lot of incredibly valuable scientific analysis. So that's things like estimating water retention, particularly when you're thinking about things like the recent and crazy um, rainstorms that we've been seeing on the American West Coast, um, massive and catastrophic flooding. Uh, estimating carbon sequestration, being able to estimate potential heat reduction and predict forward, um, to be able to monitor specific species reaction and resilience to changing climate um, so that you can actually target replant trees that are going to be stable for the next 50 years and ones that are going to be able to handle and adapt to climate change in your region. And you can then strategically plan planting to try to maximize biodiversity. Humans historically love to plant all the same species of tree along a street, because I think we think it looks really pretty. It, it does look pretty, um, but that's not really great for biodiversity. It's really providing only one type of habitat. Um, but unfortunately, tree inventories, which are sort of the traditional way that we detect and categorize trees in cities are incredibly expensive. A single inventory can cost up to $5 million. And as a result of this, many cities have never been able to do a tree inventory. And the ones that do, um, they tend to be pretty out of date and pretty limited in scope. Um, so in the work uh, I've been doing for the last year or so, we've been trying to figure out how to automate urban tree censuses. And this is building on top of amazing prior work, um, both from Pietro Barona, my, my advisor's lab, um, and some fantastic work from, uh, from um, different labs in Switzerland. Um, but what we found is that similar to many of the problems that we face, um, these models tend to work well in the areas they've been trained on 
and they struggle to generalize. Um, so we're again trying to figure out, you know, how do we handle geospatial and temporal domain shift? How do we scale this up to more cities with minimal additional labeling? Particularly in cases like this, it's not simple to identify species of trees. Um, it's not something you can scale with the crowd without teaching them how to do species ID of trees. It's a, it's a task that requires expertise. So that makes scale challenging. As a first pass to try to tackle this, um, last year we released the Auto Arborist dataset. Um, this is a curated data set that covers 23 cities across North America, um, 344 genera of trees. We decided to go to the general level instead of the species level as a first pass, um, because at the species level, tree taxonomies are very complex. There's a lot of subspecies, hybrid species, cross species, um, kind of cultivars or variants of given species that are incredibly visually distinct. Um, and then this contains 2.6 million tree records and more than a million trees with associated imagery. Um, and then the data is, you know, really representative of these real distributions. It's long, very long tailed, it's fine grained, the tree species look very similar. Um, most of the data is just these, you know, 30 frequent species. And then there's a few more that are common in this very long tail of rare species um, or rare genera. And then we have these real world spatial temporal and taxonomic structure um, that you can try to capture. And it captures these natural domain shifts um, that can, you know, again, is an example of structure in the domain that can be made use of instead of try to be um, agnostic to it. And the data contains um, both aerial and street level imagery for the same tree instance, because we're trying to move to systems that really make use of all of the data that we already have access to, that we've already collected. Um, so these are Google Street View images, as well as higher resolution aerial data coming from EOS. The data does have a lot of challenges. Um, one thing is that the data is not always at the same age. Because this data is coming from already um, built tree censuses, you can see that you know, these are often done kind of piecemeal. So this is Seattle, um, actually where I grew up. And you can see that the data is really coming in in different years and different sort of neighborhoods and chunks. And that means that, you know, for data that's maybe older, which might tend to be in areas that are, again, socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, we might have things like trees that used to exist. Here's an example here and has since died. Um, the localization accuracy of these censuses is often not great. So here you can see here's a tree and the actual sort of location recorded for that tree is not really well aligned with the tree itself, sort of nearby, estimated within a me one to three meters of accuracy. Um, those distribution shifts for urban forests are both ecological and man-made. Um, so basically, uh, you have ecological distribution shifts, which is like where trees are likely to be, but then you have these man-made ones, which is like humans think that certain, and then we'll plant them in cities, even if they never would have naturally occurred there. Um, temporal changes in foliage are a big challenge. If data is taken in the winter, it's much more difficult for a human or an AI model to identify the tree accurately. Um, young trees can be really, really difficult to ID. They're very small. Um, the data itself can be imperfect. There can be occlusion, weird angles. Um, and then there's this ambiguity because there's multiple trees per image and it's not always super clear from this alone um, what the tree of interest is. And uh, I'll get into a little bit more some of our current work trying to figure out how to disambiguate. What we did find in the paper is that models trained on the full data set usually outperform city specific or region specific models. So there is kind of this value or benefit in the diversification of the data. Um, but interestingly, this is not always true. And I think that this is a fascinating thing to explore as we think about scaling up to these like global scale computer vision systems. Um, so for example, um, if you look at Los Angeles, training just on Los Angeles on, and then testing on Los Angeles, your model performs about here. By going up to the regional uh, data, so now you're training on all the cities across the West Coast, you get a little bit of improvement but really not much, not really. From, the, from, from a stakeholder's perspective, this is changing almost nothing about how usable the model is for them. And then if you actually scale up to the entirety of North America, training sort of in the maximal diversity of the data set, your model gets a little worse. Um, this is also true for Calgary, right? The model gets worse when you go up to regional data. Um, but for many cities, there is a notable improvement from training on that city alone for looking at Charlottesville, for example, to including larger scale regional data 
um, and then an even you know additional increase in, in performance. And in average, that's definitely true. We do see that the models increase from local to regional to global um, in performance. Um, one of the factors that might be contributing to that really is the distribution shift between cities. So this is just visualizing um, the 15 or 20 most common genera of trees. And those shifts in color are really showing you how uh, these distributions, the subpopulation distribution, just the number of uh, representative examples of any given genera of tree per city um, are really shifting. And one of the things we've found is that, um, you know, performance, generalization performance is often highly correlated with similarity in distribution. Um, and so then this kind of begs the question, if you need an optimal model for some new city, you're going to work to try to build the best possible model for some new city. Um, maybe there's some specialization of that model that could be done. We actually just try to mimic the distribution. But then that does assume you need to understand, you need to be able to efficiently test the distribution of trees in a new city to be able to do any of these tricks to try to, um, to, try to shift that distribution during training or, or at some sort of modular post-processing step to the intended distribution of use of the model. Um, and then just exploring that generalizability a bit more, um, it's really clear that generalization is not just more data. So for example, Los Angeles, you know, 300,000 training examples generalizes incredibly poorly to almost all the other cities, um, really only does well in Southern California. Whereas New York City, 400,000 training examples, um, generalizes as well across the test sets as training on the entirety of the West Coast and generalizes better across the test sets than training on the entirety of the region of the central cities. Um, so there really is this, you know, this question of what is the best training set, and it's really not just necessarily the biggest. Um, finally, we do see that there is value in combining information across street level views, definitely, and then combining that with that aerial um, view as well. Um, it's very clear that trying to categorize individual trees um, from aerial data alone is incredibly challenging. That street level data is, is a lot more valuable when it comes to identifiability and, and multiple examples and ensembling across multiple examples is even more valuable. Um, part of that might be this, this uh, reduction of that ambiguity. Um, and then finally, if you do combine the aerial and multiple street level views, we do see an increased boost. And, down here, this is a really, really simple um, sort of mixture of experts version of that aggregation. Um, but the thing that's quite interesting is that the model does really learn that there are maybe some species of trees where aerial information is much more useful than others. So many trees, that aerial weight is very, very low. But some examples, you know, like this palm tree for, as, for one, um, they really is relying quite heavily on that aerial information and it makes sense actually because from street level views a lot of these tall palm trees look like telephone poles um, they're quite difficult to ID if you don't see the top. Um, so our current work uh, our, as our team at Google is we're trying to actually address that the localization and accuracy and that ambiguity in classification coming from having multiple trees in these images. And the way that we're addressing that is incorporating 3D information, incorporating LIDAR actually from the ground level views, um, incorporating geographic and temporal context to try to you know, capture some of those expected distribution shifts, um, looking at self-supervision via cross-modal agreement. So trying to figure out you know, how do you actually adapt these feature rep representations to a given city using the fact that if you have this 3D understanding of how these different views are relating to each other and which tree which pixels in each view correspond to which tree, um, then enforcing agreement across those as a self-supervision signal makes a lot of sense. Um, and then looking at things like multi-label loss and loss balancing to try to handle the multi, um, the sort of single positive label setting, I guess we're in, where you have, uh, you know that a tree of that species is somewhere in this image, but you don't know which one it is by ne like necessarily. Um, and another way that we're trying to figure out um, how to increase the localization accuracy is just doing geographic instancing. So 
not trying to categorize the trees, but just detect them from the air. And one of the values there is that um, that helps you get every tree in the city because many trees are not visible from the street. Uh, these are some preliminary results in Los Angeles, um, but the results are looking quite promising just in terms of our ability to instance trees. Um, though, of course, there are challenges. Highly dense trees from an air alone are very difficult to disambiguate. And that's kind of the value of this multi-dimensional, multi-view multi data is that then you can kind of get information from both when you're making decisions. Um, and then what we're looking at is trying to improve geographic instancing of trees. So now semantic or instance segmentation of trees in 2D and in the 3D point clouds by using um, weak instance information from the different two-dimensional views and from the aerial view. Um, and preliminary results look promising. We're getting, getting much better disambiguation of these instances of trees um, by incorporating these, this two-dimensional image pixel level information. Um, yeah. So the data set is released to the public and you're more than welcome to, uh, to um, access it. And then there's a lot of open challenges that I've talked about today in computer vision for ecology. Uh, and if you're interested in any of these, you know, global and local domain shift, long tail distribution, sparse, low quality, multimodal data, interactive ecology AI systems, equitable access to technology and increasing interdisciplinary capacity. We have an amazing, very supportive community on Slack. Um, and if you're interested in joining, there's about a thousand researchers worldwide. Um, you can email AIforconservation at gmail.com to get an invite link. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sarah, for this a very inspiring presentation and fascinating results uh, on a very complex uh, research question. I'm really wondering how you, you do all these uh, data collection and combination. That's uh, well, that's been to me. That's like most of the work. <laughs> <laughs> we have now uh, approximately uh, 10 minutes of time for questions. And uh, as far as I know, I need to check for the chat if there are questions and uh, I'm waiting for them. So far, I can't see anyone. And probably I, I can start, Sarah, with one that, that uh, came to my mind. So how do you uh, uh, evaluate the localization accuracy of those trees that you, that you uh, yeah. reconstruct? So um, most of the time, I guess it depends on, there's a few different ways you can try to evaluate. Um, if, you know, when we actually have a, uh, ground level information that's accurate. Um, so some cities are better than others, depending on their method of recording the localization. So for example, in New York City, where GPS works really badly because um, buildings are very tall, uh, their entire tree census was done with community scientists doing direct measurement from known points. And it's very accurate. It's accurate you know, within sometimes centimeters. Um, and so we can actually use that tree census data um, and as sort of evaluation sets. Um, cities where we know that the data curation practice led to very accurate localization. Um, we can also do um, some evaluation versus human labeled data um, just from the images themselves. Um, so that's, you know, now you go in and you have a human label, the real location of the different trees um, kind of in 3D or just from aerial data. And then um, you can try to do a good job there. The tricky thing is if you do the labeling just from aerial, um, ideally just intuitively, we want the label to be at the trunk of the tree. Like that's the location. It's maybe okay. And we can add some flexibility into our evaluation if that location isn't really perfect. I mean, this is not like a, this is not something where if we're off by, you know, half a meter, there's actually really any difference to a city um, or very little. Uh, you could come up with some reasons, like maybe that they're worried about infrastructure, like power lines or sewers and being accurate is better. But if you have no information, it's better to be a little inaccurate than, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. There's a follow-up question by, by Michelle Spicer. Uh, the question is whether you can say the approximate relative uncertainty on the number of trees in a city using these data sets. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it's difficult to say quantitatively across the board because we most of the time we only have information about public trees or street trees, right? Which is not all of the trees in the city. 
Um, and so the only way to really kind of get at that uncertainty is maybe versus some aerial data um, that we can label with locations that includes non-street trees. And there's an amazing data set that was put out by Jonathan Ventura at um, Cal Poly Slow, uh, where they've you know produced actually a bunch of hand labeled um, sort of locations from aerial data of sort of all the trees in the city, not just the street trees. Um, yeah, uncertainty. I mean, honestly, the the are like, you know, AOC numbers versus that data are, are quite high um, in the high 80s, which is which is pretty good. Um, but I think, you know, if you're in the north, the further north you go, the more likely the um, data was taken in the winter when there's not leaves on. I, I don't know. I think I think there's a lot um, because of all these different dimensions of complexity. There's a lot you'd need to do to actually try to measure uncertainty for any given city you wanted to use the model on before you actually decided to use it. Um. Yeah. Well, there was one question that is now gone because there was a question to go one slide back for the Gmail group Slack uh, address that you had here. Probably that this can be uh, somehow communicated afterwards. Uh, the, the, the presentation has been recorded. So I think it's, it's easy to, to check for the YouTube video afterwards and uh, read this. There's another question about uh, whether you look for invasive tree species mm. by Robin Sanford. So I think that it is potentially an application that would be very interesting. I actually think about invasive species a lot because they're a case, in, I mean, maybe not with trees, maybe they move a bit more slowly, but invasive plants that are invasive animals or invasive insects um, are this awesome example of distribution shift, right? It's something that previously in an area did not exist at all. So you will have zero training examples of that species, that invasive species in the context or the, the environmental or geospatial context um, where it might invade. Um, so then how do you actually figure out whether your model can be trusted to detect this invasive thing after it's invaded um, if you don't have any real data of it? Uh, and this is a really common question for um, people looking at, they call it biosecurity, but I'm um, trying to detect, for example, rodents on Pacific islands where, you know, a single rodent can wipe out the bird population. Well, it would have to be pregnant or you need two, but you know what I mean? Rodents really quickly wipe out bird populations. You really need to be able to detect them quite quickly. And you'd like to build machine learning models to do it, but it's very difficult to understand the uncertainty since you don't have any real data um, of a rodent in that place. They do all sorts of fun stuff trying to figure out how to create that evaluation data, like put little stuffed rats in the scene and try to see if you can detect it. Yeah. There's another question by Jacob Willem Poon. Uh, the question is regarding unbalanced data set. I think that's something I would also have in mind. Which anomaly detection or data augmentation have you explored? That's the question. Yeah. Um, for this tree data, um, we've explored a few different things, um, less explicit data augmentation, um, so far, though, that's one of the things that we hope to be able to do if we can get better instance segmentation of trees is do some clever copy paste augmentation or something, or just more interesting contrastive training. Um, we have definitely looked into and tested out um, many different types of loss balancing, oversampling, undersampling, um, sort of trying to build like the best training set to match a given distribution. Um, in the end, with a lot of these algorithmic tricks, there doesn't really seem to be any free lunch. Um, very, very rare things. Performance is basically always at zero. And um, if you want to do better on common stuff, it will be at the expense of losing some accuracy, losing some accuracy on the most frequent categories. Um, and this is often something that I, at least with the wildlife work that I do, we really talk to practitioners about, right? You can build a model that's sort of optimized for different things, um, but often there isn't a free lunch. Like if, and if it means you're going to have to, you really care about this very rare species, you can try to build a model that's as good as possible at that rare species, but you might over predict it. And so now you're going to have to do more human cleaning if you really need incredibly high recall for a rare species. Um, 
because you're going to over predict it in some way because it's not actually very common. Hey, yeah, there's, I think, a final question uh, that is whether data is available somewhere. That's, of course, always an interesting question whether one can try to reproduce or even extend work. So, yeah, so the, um, there's, well, if you're interested in ecological data in general, um, Dan Morris runs um, Lila.science, which is an amazing public repository for machine learning curated data. Um, the Auto Arborist data set is public but you do have to go through kind of a, an annoying legal process with Google, which is basically because it's Street View data, it's the largest published Street View data set by an order of magnitude ever. Um, you have to agree to do takedown because uh, if someone did find that there was personally identifiable information that wasn't properly blurred in the data, it would need to be taken down for ethical reasons. So you have to kind of go through this process where you sign a, an agreement that basically says, I will take down the data. But because it has to go through Google lawyers, we have found that that process can be quite slow. So it's getting more and more efficient over time, which is good. Interesting experience for me as well, learning about publishing data from a company versus an academic institution. Okay, so there's, before I, I, I introduce the next speaker, there's Miguel, who has already uh, also a, a question to you before you start with this presentation. So Miguel, please go ahead. Yeah, fantastic presentation, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, so inspiring. Um, so uh, if you see this presentation, a lot of potential applications come to your mind. And I was just wondering what, what, what are the plans now? I mean, you could think of calculating the cooling potential in, in, in cities, combining in that with remote sensing data, understanding mm -hmm. technology, I, I don't know, but um, maybe you can enlighten us a little bit what, what's, the, what's the future. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the immediate future for me at least is, is really figuring out um, how do we efficiently evaluate how trustworthy these models are? Like what is the way, you know, if, if I want to build a map for every treaty, every tree you know, in a city in North America, when is that good and when do we need to kind of turn the crank, collect more labeled data? Um, what really is that? Um, and I think without a better sense of uncertainty, um, I do, you wouldn't wanna build sort of a scaled map um, beyond where you'd evaluated the model. But I think in the cases where we do have cities that we know the model is quite trustworthy, I'm really excited to collaborate with the ecologists we've been talking to um, for example, Jarleth and Neil Dunn at the University of Vermont, um, they work directly with cities already, um, kind of giving information from remote sensing data um, to the sort of necessary stakeholders in a way that they can actually actionably um, use it. And so um, I'm a huge fan of like not trying to be a tech savior and like finding and engaging really directly with the right collaborators um, to make sure that you're not missing some of the nuance because I'm not an expert in urban forests. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential and I think it's really a matter of, um, you know, making the information accessible and the intuition or the knowledge of the types of failures of the models accessible so that people can then use that in a way that mitigates risk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So thanks again, Sarah, for this presentation and for the audience to, uh, to ask questions. And it's now... A pleasure for me to introduce the second speaker of the day, Miguel Maischer uh, from Leipzig University. Miguel is a full professor and head of the Earth System Data Science Group at uh, the Remote Sensing Center for Earth System Research. His main scholarly interests are on understanding ecosystem responses to climate extremes, as well as the human environment nexus during extremes. He also works on understanding macroecological dynamics and ecosystem functioning. His research is based on the latest data driven research methods to explore high dimensional Earth observations. Over the last years, he has developed the Earth System Data Cube concept and combines empirical findings with theoretical and conceptual understanding to understand complex interactions in the Earth system. Miguel Maicha serves as uh, SSC member of uh, ILEAP's Integrated Land Ecosystem Atmosphere Process Study, a future Earth global research project, and is member of the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research and other international projects. During his time at the Max Planck Institute of Biogeochemistry in Jena, I enjoyed an intensive and successful collaboration with him. And I'm looking now forward to his presentation entitled Unraveling the Effect of Climate Extremes on Ecosystems Towards Predictive Capabilities. Miguel, please go ahead. Thank you for the nice introduction, Joachim. Let me share my screen. Yeah. So it's really a pleasure to 
to talk to you here today uh, and uh, it's a little bit difficult not to switch topics because I'm still thinking about <laughs> urban trees, but let's let's move on uh, here to, to talk about the effect of climate extremes on ecosystems. So uh, this is actually work that I have done with many collaborators. I can't list them all, but I try to, to highlight them whenever appropriate. And um, allow me to start with a little bit of a background. So we all know that climate is changing right now. And uh, one of the most pronounced effects is actually that climate extremes are also on the rise. And this is actually very clear for, for hot extremes. This is actually uh, from the latest IPCC report, the, the evidence from, from the past. And you see that hot extremes are increasing almost everywhere in the world. This is kind of a sketch of, of the world map. And, and they have a very strong confidence in, in, this, in this trend. Uh, Certain regions of the world are also facing an increase in droughts and other types of extremes. But what you can also then imagine is that the combination of such extremes is actually particular and worrying us, uh, scientists, as society in general. Um, so as ecologists, we are not so much interested in the direct effects of heat on human well-being, but really rather we are the, the feedback through the vegetation. And to speak more generally, maybe uh, through the feedback um, in the carbon cycle. So uh, what is the carbon cycle about? This is actually the main um, machine that, that is run by, by the biosphere um, and that interacts with, with our climate system. And what, what is the main process here is actually that carbon dioxide is actually taken up by vegetation via photosynthesis. It's kind of stored in plants, in soils, and at a certain point is also going back to the atmosphere via respiratory processes. And if you look at the global numbers here, 120, that's actually petagram um, carbon per, per year that are coming in and going out, those two fluxes are actually in balance on, 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 on the land ecosystem. Humans are, of course, perturbing those fluxes. But if we increase the heat, if we increase the droughts, then of course we would actually disturb those processes we would actually disturb photosynthesis, we would maybe accelerate respiration and bring those, those fluxes out of balance, which you can think of leading to an additional feedback to the climate change effect as well. The same can happen somewhat in the, in the ocean. It's a different type of research. I'm also not an expert on this, but people are also worried about uh, similar feedbacks with, with the ocean. And for the rest of the talk, there's actually one term that I would like to introduce, which is important, which is just cross primary productivity, which is the total uptake of CO2 from ecosystems, um, or let's say just photosynthesis. And uh, this is actually the main uh, flux that is actually relevant here. Um, the, the question that we have is now, we do have extremes in the climate system. And think about this blue, um, yeah, two-dimensional distribution here as the climate system and this is of course more dimensional and think about the extremes that happen here at the, at the edges of the distribution and our question is what do these extremes mean for the biosphere which is again a multivariate thing uh, because sometimes we, we see that actually those events do translate in, in, in very strong responses and sometimes in, in less strong responses so why is this why do the same type of extreme may cause devastating effects in some regions and not so devastating effects in other regions? And uh, we are wondering, let's say, if similar extremes lead to different responses, why, what is controlling that? And uh, you can actually start to think about uh, entire feedback loops uh, here. So the first question is, we have climate extremes. What happens, or what mediates their, their impacts on functions? And that can be, for example, diversity, different types of diversity. It's not only the diversity in terms of number of species, but it's also the diversity in the number of landscape heterogeneity, in terms of the functional properties of plants and so forth. And humans are altering this diversity. So that means that we are having an active role that controls how strong the impacts will be. And those impacts then propagate to um, human uh, um, natural services to human well-being like pollination, food security, and so forth. And in this actually, in this small commentary, we discussed the possibility there might be also a feedback uh, to changing um, the atmospheric uh, composition and maybe also extremes at the, at, at the end. So this is highly speculative, but the, the link from extremes 
via diversity to the ecosystem functioning is, is very well studied. And um, the question is how to quantify this link precisely in particular, considering that we are changing the biodiversity of the earth. In order to tackle this question, we need data. And uh, we are lucky somehow that the world is monitored globally uh, with an insane amount of sensors. Those sensors are heterogeneous. They are partly based on the ground. They are based partly based on, on in, in space. And uh, the question is how to combine them and to make uh, global data streams that we can explore to understand this coupled system. Because this is something that, that I, I would like to emphasize here that is interesting for us. We are really interested in the interactions of the biosphere in the atmosphere or the biosphere and the hydrosphere and, and the geosphere. We are the exchange of fluxes of matter and, and information and, and, and energy. And the question is how to, to quantify those interactions and how to understand how they, these exchanges change under extreme events. The data streams that, that we, we, we have are often a combination of the different sensors towards global products. So we are talking about downstream data products, nothing that directly comes from the satellite often. Sometimes it's really already a combination of different data that has been maybe generated via some machine learning approach. And sometimes you will also find some unexpected data sets that you would not have anticipated at a, um, a priori, for example, Paul Bodesheim, who now works with, with Joachim, did this beautiful study here where he actually took in situ treeing data. So the increment, the growth increment of tree rings that are very indicative for, for climate in, impacts or cl climate variability and used some machine learning to upscale the spatial patterns of these annual um, anomalies in, in the tree ring increments. And this is something which allows us to reconstruct in space, for instance, how uh, vegetation responds to extremes. Um, something very interested, uh, interesting and, and, and quite uncommon because typically you use the streamings to reconstruct the past over, over um, centuries and, and millennia and not so much to reconstruct the spatial um, patterns. Um, again, uh, as Sarah, we work at a, not at a species level, but at the level of, of the genus because this is just much more precise. But um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about um, uh, the, the multi-dimensional extremes that we want to, to understand. And the, the prerequisite for that is that we have a lot of data sets that are relevant um, in an in a interoperable way. So um, the Earth is monitored, it is monitored very well, but all the initiatives are actually working mostly in isolation. So we have observations of soil moisture, of atmosphere um, states and, and variables, but it's sometimes very, very hard as scientists really um, bring them together. And, and of course, you have, you have large collections of such data sets, but those collections uh, do come with the caveat that their data are not really interoperable. So they are coming at different spatial or temporal resolutions. And it would be just much more convenient if we would have all the data sets available in the same space-time resolution. And um, together with the European Space Agency, we have been working over the last years to produce something which we call the Earth System Data Cube, or concept or, or the principle where we have a whole set of gridded earth system observations such that we can really um, um, explore them together. And uh, if you're interested, please visit this website here. Uh, the nice thing is that any dimension of these data cubes can be visited in their own right. So it doesn't matter if it's space or time or variables for us, this is just another dimension. And that means that any cube that we generate or process at the end will also be a cube but maybe of the different dimensionality. And this is a very, very yeah, intuitive concept to work with. And it also really is a different paradigm compared to the old GIS type of applications. Um, if you're interested in that kind of um, data, I also would like to visit, in, invite you to visit uh, lexcube.org. This is actually our uh, interactive data cube viewer where you can yeah, have here, as you see, see a direct interaction with terabyte of this data. This is global temperature. But if you click here, you can actually um, select the entire collection of whatever is interesting for you. Maybe, for example, here the fraction of light that it's used for photosynthesis. And you can um, understand how this data look like uh, in reality, or you can even animate them. So this is just for 
for like to, to make such data also more accessible like uh, for for getting an intuition i think this is this is very very important sarah said something similar i think making data available without barriers is 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 a task for us scientists and we should not just leave that to, to someone but really work on it so this is actually a phd project by uh by maximilian Söchting, uh, which i like a lot um here is it uh, and uh, we are working here together with computer um, scientists in order to make this scalable on, for example, mobile phones and, and tablets and also uh, with high resolution satellite data and so forth. But coming back to the question, what are actually multivariate extreme events in such data cubes? So think about uh, two variables, X and Y, and in a linear um, correlation case, then finding uh, the, the extreme events and such variables is kind of easy. We just need to fit an ellipsoid on this data and everything which is outside those ellipsoid you could consider as extreme. Um, you see already here that an univariate extreme detection doesn't work because you would actually consider values extreme that are actually not, not really extreme in the correlated case. The whole thing becomes a little bit more complicated if such variables are um, correlated in some nonlinear way and then uh, fitting an ellipse would not work anymore. So you would actually have to find something more interesting. And we compared all kinds of multivariate anomaly detection methods uh, in this paper from 2017. And there has been actually um, recent advances that really go far beyond what we have done here, of course. But, but still the problem to my mind is not totally solved yet to have a, a fully intuitive multidimensional extreme event detection approach that um, that works also on, on, on big spatial temporal data sets. Um, in this case, we did a combination of uh, dimensionality reduction and uh, density estimation, which works pretty okay, and which was the basis for the following work, because it allowed us to, to really detect in the data cube events that we have also been known for many years. So at the end, what comes out of this combination of uh, techniques is something like an anomaly score that tells us how far away are we from the normal situation. And the more reddish the colors are here, the more extreme you are. And now, of course, you have again the, pro the problem that you have to kind of find a parameter of telling us how extreme do we want to go. But but if you if you do a smart um, adjustment here, then you would actually identify those. Um, those uh, events that have been known over many decades, for example, as you will see in a second, the Russian heat wave 2010, which is actually maybe the, the biggest spatial temporally connected extreme event that has affected the northern hemisphere over the, the last um, decades. This is actually the blob that's forming here. And um, an a very important takeaway here is that such extreme events do happen as a spatial temporal object. And I always say it's like a two more in in this data cubes and we want to find those tumors and and then um, go for an interpretation um, of them so you see that they have a very distinct shape and this shape is actually very well well known from the literature as well but having now all these data sets at, at hand we can also ask not only from atmospheric side what is actually the, the extreme um, conditions but also ask about about the impacts and this is actually what we did then. So we dig this blob here and, and ask what happens here. And if you go for GPP, that's actually the variable that is related to photosynthesis or the total uptake of CO2, you see that this variable reacts uh, in, in, in a binary way. So in some areas, we have a positive response in the nodes and sometimes you have a negative response. And this was quite, quite a surprise to us. And then we, we started to ask, why is that? So we look deeper in it and we found that this boundary here corresponds quite nicely to the change in land cover types. And so uh, this is an indication that we need to really um, include more um, secondary information to, to come to an interpretation. And this is actually um, something that we did in this study where we went globally, we searched for all those events and we tried to interpret them with some external machine learning approach and identified in which, which of those events are positive and negatively affected and, and what, what are the reasons for this um, positive negative responses. And you can see very nice things that forest cover kind of buffers against those um, impacts. Or you can also see that the duration of the event has a, has a negative uh, trigger, um, the same as the absolute values of temperature and so forth. And this interpretation is ecologically very sound. Um, 
I have to say though that this doesn't include lag effects, so it's not complete. So forests may die later. This is a problem that we see particularly in Germany right now. And but but it gives you an intuition of of what are the main factors that are driving the impacts of extreme events. However, this analysis is very crude and of course, in a sense, we are relying on, on data products. And the question is actually, how good are the data products really to, to understand extreme event impact? And, and this is something which leads us to, to use remote sensing at much higher resolutions and, and think about the local scale. So how well do remote sensing products really represent what is happening on the ground? And uh, the European Space Agency has launched the Sentinel-2 missions, which give us 10 meter resolution global data sets every few days on vegetation um, greenness or vegetation states. And this is actually a very suitable data set we would think of to, to find such extreme events. And Daniel Pabon did a PhD thesis with us and um, trying to, to predict the impacts uh, using also classical machine learning uh, locally. By the way, he also was playing quite a bit with, with uh, this balanced data set here and correcting for that and so forth. So quite similar problems because the sites that we have locally to measure GPP are not distributed well over the globe and so forth. And um, what he did is to try to predict the, the CO2 uptake only from vegetation reflectance as we see that in the satellite. And you see that for most cases, this works pretty nicely. So the, the red dots are actually the observed dots and the different um, time series here come from different sites where we truly measure the CO2 uptake. And the blue and green colors are two types of prediction. And you see it works almost, almost very well, except in Germany 2018. And this is actually the biggest heat extreme that Germany has suffered over the last decades. So during the extreme event, it seems that the model would predict um, that we are still having a normal year while the in situ measurements tell us that photosynthesis went down. So we don't, we don't really get this part. And, and the reason is that the reflectance of vegetation kind of continues to be more or less normal, but in fact, the physiology of the plant does something else. So this is a challenge that, that keeps us kind of awake still today. And uh, there have been quite some animations um, since then, for example, and David Montero, Another PhD student working with Sebastian Wienicke um, developed a library to compute all thinkable vegetation indices, so to have also nonlinear combinations of vegetation indices as predictors. This was just published, uh, I think, last, last week or so in scientific data. And then um, we tried to use those values directly as predictors that didn't improve much. So they are working currently on combining them um, with some um, LSTMs, so we use different model architectures for LSTMs with such indices to do the prediction. And we thought this must solve the problem, but it does not. So also here you see a reduction in, in, in GPP, which is not captured by LSTMs, including novel vegetation indices in the prediction step. So something, some, there's some, some piece of information that, that we are measuring here. I should say, however, that uh, the model has never seen the site. So the model is trained elsewhere and then applied to the site conditions. Um, another PhD um, thesis is carried out by Francesco Martinuzzi, who is actually an expert in eco-state um, networks and reservoir computing. Um, and he compares this method, which was really hyped as one that can predict uh, nonlinear dynamics and system very well. And uh, we thought, OK, maybe this is the solution. Same sites. I have to say here, the prediction setup is different, although the prediction targets are a bit different. But what I find interesting about this um, result here, and this is pretty pretty new results, I also just saw them for the first time yesterday, is that across the sites, the prediction is pretty similar across models. So I don't want to go into details. But it tells us somewhat that actually it's not so much the, cho the choice of the deep learning model that is decisive here, but, but there must be something else that, that we are missing and we are not entirely sure um, what's going on here. So one argument could be that the satellites as we are used to, to, to apply them, let's say using spectral information only is maybe not enough alone and we should probably take much more information. So um, there's an ongoing study by both students actually together using Sentinel-1 and 2 and soil water indices derived from other remote sensing data. So this is actually radar information and uh, 
optical information and maybe also here land surface temperature. And if you combine all of this information with an LSTM, you can get a little bit closer. I mean, you're not, not there yet, but you come a little bit closer. So um, you see that's a hard fight to get this uh, predictions right during the streams, not during normal conditions. That, that problem is solved, but really during the extremes and, and um, yeah, any suggestion in this direction is of course very welcome. Along these lines, we are also currently um, working um, with the European Space Agency on doing a comparison of methods. And the idea is a bit the following. So we, we have these big events that you, that you have seen before, like this macro blobs. And from that, actually, we, we sample mini cubes, so small spatial temporal data cubes from remote sensing and climate data within and outside those events. And then we would actually um, do a challenge of all kinds of um, spatial temporal uh, machine learning methods to find out which ones are the ones that, that get us closest to, to predict um, the responses during the extreme event. And here we have a um, yeah, kind of preparing a challenge. And again, we are happy for participation and contributions. And if so, please contact Chao Nan Chi, who is actually doing the scientific coordination for the project. Uh, together, nice collaboration here with, with our partners from the Max Planck, Valencia, and Brockman Consult. But maybe one thing that we are, we are starting to, to, to believe every day more is that. Uh, we should include additional information. And we have here the talk, talk, um, talk by, by Sarah on biodiversity and biodiversity is maybe the dimension that we are, that is just not really encoded in, in standard remote sensing information. And uh, we should say here that biodiversity is a multidimensional phenomenon. So it's not just counting species. It's also the structure of, of the system. It's also the functions that are coming with it. And uh, in particular, what is important about um, how the ecosystem um, responds is the functional diversity, so the diversity of the functional organ, organismic um, properties um, in the plants that, that co-occur at a specific site. And the problem is a little bit that we don't have this information locally um, available, at least globally, that's, that's very difficult. And there's different avenues you can now think of including such information. And in our group, we're actually working in, in different directions. And uh, I would like to highlight two PGCs. This is one by Sophie Wolf. So she has been also working with iNaturalist. And uh, what she did is to take all the observations from iNaturalist uh, on species occurrences and combine that with trait information. So information which plant property is related to which plant and can come up with global maps of plant property. So for global studies, this is maybe a solution because it gives us uh, interesting gradients of plant properties and also functional diversity. For the very local um, cases, this is maybe not enough. So first of all, if you're, if you're interested, there's a nice paper by, on, by Sophie on, on this new data set that's also available um, in nature ecology and evolution last year. And, and for, for going locally, there's maybe other solutions needed. And uh, we have uh, Eya Sharif, and, and Eya is doing a fantastic work exploiting the potential of hyperspectral data combined with in situ plant properties and, and doing predictions here in order to, to really predict from hyperspectral data what are different plant properties, like, for example, chlorophyll content or leaf area index and so forth. And uh, she can now apply that to. to to remote sensing data that have the same kind of spectral resolution, which is very exceptional. There's only a few satellites who can do that. And then she can actually come up with maps of this um, functional traits. And uh, this, pub this study was also just published in, um, last week. And I think it's quite exciting because it brings us one step um, closer to, to estimate functional diversity from space uh, and also at arbitrary locations worldwide. And yeah, we didn't. I make the step yet by, by combining this information of biodiversity estimates on one side and really doing the time series prediction of extreme event impacts on the other side. But uh, I, I wanted to show you both sides to, to show you a little bit the avenue that we are working on and um, yeah, invite, invite you for collaborations. Um, and this brings me already to my take home messages. So what I wanted to convey here is that the impact of extreme events definitely depend on the ecosystem structure and maybe also its diversity. And uh, our challenge is now to consider these local effects. Only if we are able to consider those two um, dimensions, we, we, we hope to come 
across this, this gap between the local data and what remote sensing really tells us. And machine learning is certainly the way it's very helpful. We didn't really achieve the disentangling the, the full complexity of the dynamics yet. Um, yeah, maybe because we were not smart enough to use transformers in due time, but <laughs> we are looking forward to you advice. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Miguel, for this uh, fantastic presentation of different application areas of machine learning. And uh, uh, are there any questions from the audience yet? If not, I can bridge with one question from my side. Uh, so you are lacking some uh, prediction capabilities of these deep neural network models. And uh, the, uh, it, wouldn't it be the, the, the reason because you have no causality informed models at the moment and that just correlations that are learned from the data is not sufficient to, to tackle these complex dynamics? Yeah, that could be one, one argument. Um, I, I doubt, however, that that causality solves it all also here because the, we, we see that the prediction works very well under most conditions. It's really just the extremes that we don't get. It's very rare moments. And it can happen, at least from an physiological point of view, that under very extreme stress conditions, ecosystems just work differently than under normal conditions. So there are some instances where you find, for example, a decoupling of certain processes of photosynthesis and transpiration and so forth. And that could mean I'm not sure if this makes sense now, but it could mean that you, you might have a different causal network under extreme conditions. And that's one that you really can, cannot really learn from the normal conditions. So um, for me, the question is how to do that, because if you, if you think that a causal model is kind of um, invariant and always valid, um, and this, violate, this assumption is kind of violated during extreme events, then, then it's, it's, it's maybe not a solution in this case. Just okay, there are now questions from, from the audience. Alison Loudness is asking, in the work of FLAC21 and Papon22, what machine learning were you using? Surely vegetation data is too old to predict current trends, need daily, blended daily satellite data. Uh, so that's more about what kind of data is used and whether it's the proper one. So yeah, I mean, I honestly have now shown quite a slew of studies, so they're not really comparable. That's a little bit maybe the problem. So um, we always start um, with simple methods uh, like classical machine learning, like XGBoost or something like that for getting a first intuition. Um, and then we go to LSTMs and uh, RNNs. And um, as I said, at the latest, we are, we are playing with, with um reservoir computing because it is actually it seems quite quite efficient way to to work with such data at least from theory but um, they are a little bit hard to to train and uh, it, it's it's not trivial at all let's say but uh, yeah we're, we're trying to, to use them all and um, always go into in, in the comparison of, of methods we also have there's also this question about um, data augmentation I mean we, we have also tried for example to to pre-process the data by, by applying some, some, some filters and for example, decompose the time series into different frequency domains and use them as predictors. And that has allowed us to improve the predictions quite a bit. I, I don't exactly understand why this is the case uh, because you also have more parameters then, but on the other hand, uh, this seems to stabilize the prediction results quite a bit. Okay, so the second question that is, is here relates to a similar one that I, uh, uh, addressed to you with causal inference and causal discovery methods. I think that has been already uh, answered. Uh, the, the next one is by Jacob Willem Bruin, uh, whether you have any data on the impact of extreme events on algae blooms and wetlands carbon sequestration rates. Yeah, I mean, funny that you ask for algae blooms. Um, so the algae blooms is something that we actually never really addressed until last summer, because in last summer, the, the, there was a big extreme event in, in Germany, at least it was, it was warm and the river levels have fallen to quite a um, catastrophic level. And uh, the, the river Odra, which is actually the, the frontier um, river between Germany and, and Poland collapsed. And we saw a massive algae bloom. And this was something that was kind of first reported in the media as a big uh, fish dieback. And, uh, 
talking with a friend who's working on that area, actually, we, we decided to go for, for some remote sensing um, exploration. And it is surprising how well you can actually see um, algae blooms from space. Even with 10 meter resolution in rivers, this worked fantastic. And um, you don't actually need machine learning for the detection here because it's just obvious. You just need an anomaly detector. But why you need machine learning here is to do the translation of the greenness to the chlorophyll content. And that's something that is actually trained on large databases. And uh, this is actually where our partner, the, the company Brockman Consult is an expert in, and they have developed this uh, algorithm. Um, and, and that's just, just a standard actually, um, yeah, not too deep neural network that can do the prediction pretty well and it's super accurate. I think this is a pretty um, straightforward problem and, and, and easy tool to solve. Okay, there's another link that is made uh, for your PhD student, uh, Miguel, uh, to, to work with orbital sidekick data. Obviously, that's what is this hyperspectral satellite in the orbit. And uh, Alison Loudness wants to connect. So that's for you, just a side note to you. Okay, perfect. I mean, yeah, so Aya Sharif is working kind of in, in our um, institute. She's not directly with me. I, I would recommend you to directly contact her, but I will note you, your name and give her um, the contact so that she will shortly. It is super um, enthusiastic, I'm sure, to talk with you. Thank you. OK, are there any other questions? So this seems not to be the case. Then it's, uh, uh, I'm really happy that we had you both here. Thanks a lot, Sarah and Miguel, for those uh, very nice presentations. Uh, thanks to the organization here for, for managing the infrastructure and of course also thanks a lot to the audience and uh, the questions that have been asked and uh, we now uh, reconvene on the, in this uh, second room where you are able to, to contact the speakers again and uh, continue discussions. Thanks a lot to all of you. Bye bye. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop and build your personalized AI for good program. Let's shape the future of AI for good. AI is a powerful tool. summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.